you're, you've done some history podcasts here <laughs> and, and you're just and technology and, and, and bounces in the world and Europe really benefited from that. Uh, philosophy, uh, you, could, you could argue liberalism and democracy, the enlightenment, so much of what the West holds dear comes from the Middle East, which the West really wants to deny. Welcome to Al Hakam Inspire. Today's guest is Dr. Jeremy Wilderman, who is an adjunct professor at Carleton University and a fellow at the Human Rights Research and Education Center at the University of Ottawa in Canada. He has been a longtime critical analyst and practitioner of overseas aid in the Middle East with further scholarly interests in international relations, Middle East politics, human security, and even anti-colonialism. Professor Jeremy attained his PhD from the University of Exeter's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, and he's appeared on national television, lots of news outlets, and he's really been analyzing, in particular, international aid and why international aid has been failing. Um, Dr. Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So we want to start with... Um, donors international donors and international aid and we want to go into the oslo accords as well because you've done a lot of work in that between israel and palestine and talk about other countries but just as a starting point how does international aid work we've all heard about it and we know you know millions sometimes billions of dollars or pounds or euros are being given but how, how does what's the structure of this it's 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 a very complex question and one way I like to divide it early on is between what states or governments are intending to do when they're giving out this aid. And this very large group of practitioners who mean well, uh, let's, and let's, since we're talking about the Middle East, in the Middle East region, um, when it comes to governments, it's almost certainly for reasons of real politics. So when they're giving this aid, you have to try and understand what is the underlying reason they're giving that aid. And it usually has to do with power and control. And, and when we think of the Middle East, you can think of what, what would it be access to resources in the region and maintaining when it comes to Europe in general. And when Europe thinks about its, its so-called southern neighborhood, maintaining security for itself. And for Europeans, security consists of keeping the region quiet and very unfortunately um, sort of our history with the history of Europe with with colonialism racism of, of, of sort of maintaining limited migration that is very clear when you look at Europe's approach to the region yeah I thought I'd just discern because it, it's so hard because you do deal with some very fantastic individuals who I can think of many who go say who are of European origin uh, or are are, are uh, and whatever their race or identity come from Europe or the West who, who go to the region and, and, and are very genuine in their approach to trying to support people there. Um, they may not have access to the largest resources of, of aid and, and may not be that politically influential, but within this, there's many people who are intending to do good. And I just have to add also that intention doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna lead to anything. And that also working with other cultures and working with the, the so-called political economy of other cultures, is as complex i've heard the the comparison to blame as complex as conducting brain surgery uh this is one comparison i've heard and and i think it's very accurate because people are complex and societies are complex and especially when you don't know anything about these regions which is often the case of westerners going in uh, who may or may not have a, a passing and maybe poorly informed uh especially when it comes to the middle east in the last 20 years a poorly informed observation of the region uh, they really need time, even those individuals, to understand the region in, in order to be able to provide support. So it's, as I described at the beginning, it's very complex. Uh, I think there's many people intending to do good, and there's many governments intending to do what governments have always done, which is is to sort of engage in real politics. Right. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really important caveat, which you're saying that there are, um, you know, other vested interests behind those donations that are going there um and that's important to keep in mind let's let's go to the oslo accords um which took place in 1993 and it was celebrated that this is going to be you know this is going to create peace between israel and palestine tell us about 
uh, the Oslo Accords, what what they aim to achieve, and um, what the role of the donors um, was in this whole treaty. Well, technically, the Oslo Accords uh, intended to bring peace to the broader Middle East. It was it was it was a peace plan that um, the Norwegians took a big role in, in in facilitating between Israel and the Palestinians and. Uh, the idea was, especially once the Americans came in, that it could fit into a broader peace plan that they they had been really dreaming of themselves since the Carter administration in the late 1970s with the first Camp David Accord between Israel and Egypt, which was. And up to that point, I have to say, like if you look at UN records up to the 1980s, they, the, the UN and the world is very concerned about Israel and Palestine. In fact, this is just some, there's one quote where a Secretary General talks about something like a third of the UN business by the early 1980s, it has to deal with the Palestinians and Israel. Now, I don't know if that's, you can't say that's an exact number, but it was a lot. And, and you can think about the United Nations and international affairs, Israel and Palestine have often been at the center of it because the Middle East is often at the center of the world. And there's many other complex reasons that it has been, including the global self identifying with the Palestinians and the global North often with Israel, um, the position of the, play, of, of the location in the Cold War, um, just within the war on terror that happens later. There's just many, many reasons. Uh, for the United States, they thought, uh, a lot of Americans and, and many Western observers thought that solving, so-called solving Israel and Palestine would lead to uh, a solution for peace in the entire Middle East. Uh, also, it seems that as the Soviet Union was declining and they supported the United States in its uh, uh, invasion of Kuwait to remove the Iraqis in the early 1990s, that one of the deals, sort of one of the agreements was that the United States would then pursue uh, a more genuine Israel and Palestine peace plan. Uh, so this actually, something really got underway in Madrid in 1991 and Moscow in 1992. But So there was actually a broader Middle East peace process that you can trace to 1991 that Oslo fits into starting in 1993. Oslo, uh, again, it, 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 the, the idealism was that Israel and Palestine would, over a period, say five years ago, would come to some sort of agreement where they could uh, coexist with the Palestinians, basically being semi-autonomous on uh, the occupied Palestine territory, which is the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, and Israel and the rest of what was historically Palestine when the UN partitioned it in 1947. Uh, this has sort of been the model, actually, since the United Nations uh, partitioned the land and and uh, and Britain ruled it as a colony in the 1940s. So this has been, the, we, the international community has been trying to make something work on that model of effectively you can say since that time. And, and this is the more modern iteration. And actually technically the Oslo Peace Accords are still running, you could say, uh, but they're not working obviously. And foreign aid was a big part of supporting them. But I'll, I'll let you maybe step in before I get into that. Sure. Yeah. Let's get into that a little bit more. So from the accords and other donations, um, how much was promised? How much, you know, in terms of actual numbers and how much did Palestine actually re receive? There's not really a set amount. The idea was, and so this is where one of the problems comes in early on. You can see hints of in, in 1993, this idea. Uh, so the World Bank and sort of Westerners take over the development model in the early, in the mid in 1993 really and the mid 1990s and this is a time when the soviet union collapses so there's no sort of um, sort of counter idea of economics and politics to the united states uh, and this is when you see sort of that sort of hyper uh, we'd maybe say neoliberalism or uh, american approach to uh, international economics and, and international politics the Washington, so-called Washington Consensus era. Uh, so they, they go in and they say, well, we have two sort of equal parties here, kind of at war with each other, but one of them is non-Western and naturally less civilized and more jealous of the Western country that has all these you know, successes of, and accoutrements of civilization and democracy. And so what we need to do is catch them up and make them more democratic and convince them that they can live in peace with the other side. And so this is, you can see right here that colonialist mentality that is, is very strong in, in that era still, because the West is barely out of colonialism and the West is now mostly not 
uh, accepted sort of the evils that colonialism represents, uh, especially at an intellectual level and especially in economics. So this, this model is set in place and there's not really specifics on funding, you could say, but there's almost like a blank check of like, let's make this work. Uh, this is very important, but the idealism was still there. I mean, behind that really bad model that uh, peace talks would work. Uh, a lot of people invested incredible amounts of political capital into trying to make peace talks work, but there was also questions, particularly, uh, you know, how, to what extent did you know? Would you want to give up land if you're Israel? That, that you don't have to, right? Yeah, just to clarify here, so there was was there money being sent then to Palestine for them to, you know, like you're saying, quote unquote, establish themselves and be democratic. There was money coming, right, from Western donors. Yeah, there was there is always money coming in, and but and then money, especially in 1993, and this is common just across the world, right, could sort of get shifted towards democracy building, so to speak. So in the 1990s, democracy building was was one of the big. Uh, because there was this automatic assumption, effectively, in the 1990s, let's be honest, that, that in the North just said the South is autocratic and, and that's holding them back. And that, that's the whole reason the South is poor. <laughs> it's nothing to do with history. And if only they can democratize and then embrace liberalism and then we can all move forward. Had nothing, nothing to do with it. And, and then you have many people who will believe the, the silly arguments such as that India benefited from British rule, right? Uh, without, uh, that are largely debunked by this point, uh, let's say today, but in, you know, in the past, there's that, those arguments about colonialism having some economic upside were still fairly strong. And there's just always been a reluctance by the West to accept the uh, damage done by colonialism. Right. So why did the Oslo Accords fail? I know you did an analysis as well where you looked at keywords um, and even, hum I mean, if other um, nations who were part of it, especially Western nations, America, Canada, Europe, um, they didn't see it as a human right issues. Actually, you, I think in, in, in your research, you said Europe did, but it had to follow America. Yeah, and, and Europe's changing now too, right? So I, I, to... To what extent? So uh, often the Israel-Palestine is you can look at it in the north-south axis, right? The Palestinians are are aligned with the south that has been colonized, and Israel more with the north, which has been a colonizer. And this is the ac how the axis works. So when you look at the main allies of Israel, it tends to be the colonizer countries, and the Palestinians, it's the global south, the G77 plus one, China. So that tends to be more the uh, this is this tends how to be this plays out, and why it's still so important within the world right now, because we're seeing that shift taking place that where the world's no longer a unipolar sort of Western or American, relatively um, Israel, Palestine is quiet within that, but it still sort of sits on that axis, which is why it remains so important. And the Palestinian interest in the Palestinians remains very strong in the global south. It wasn't that long ago that uh, a couple of years ago now, three years ago, I think, that I'd have to check up the year that, that the Palestinian Authority was actually the head of the G77 plus one, right? So that's that's considering they don't technically have a state, a physical state, that's quite an influential role. Even if I think it's 138 countries recognize them as having a state, almost all in the global south, other than Iceland and Sweden. And Iceland and Sweden are kind of always outliers on, on, on these north-south uh, axes. Yeah, absolutely. So from, from your perspective, why did you feel that kind of it was important to, to carry out this analysis. I was one of those naive Westerners who went over to the Middle East. And I'll say just my own arc was that I had went to really the history and of the Middle East was excluded, including just, you know, you, you can't really exclude the history of the Middle East because you don't have Western civilization without Islamic civilization, right? We just, just uh, you're, you've done some history podcasts here and, and you're just and technology and, and advances in the world. And Europe really benefited from that uh, philosophy. Uh, you could you could argue liberalism and democracy, the Enlightenment. So much of what the West holds dear comes from the Middle East, which the West really wants to deny because of its uh, history, that historical uh, origins, etc. Um, whatever, but it exists, and and that sort of reluctance to accept that. So I, I it's very dominant in North America in the academy. So I, I had went to the Middle East to just see the region firsthand after one of my degrees and I ended up 
long story, um, setting up a youth development charity in the in the West Bank uh, in the 2000s during the sort of the height of the Second Intifada, when you could see that, in this case, it was in the city of Nablus, uh, you could see that um, well, there's incredible violence that young people were facing, and uh, those the regions that were most violent tended not to get support. So this was became one of my focus areas at the time. Uh, it was a city that was itself in siege during the 2000s, and and uh, I won't get into the details, but I would say like I I was just I wouldn't understand the structures or theories or that what I was just describing about north south colonialism historical conflicts. Uh, I was one of those people who goes over and, and, and wants to provide support and, and is pretty genuine uh, as much as you can be without first knowing the region and, and the cultural baggage you always have when you go to another region. Um, and then I, I, I was interested in why you could see the incredible amount of foreign aid that was going in, including in that period. It actually spiked quite a lot, uh, and including from governments that you would consider in the mid 2000s quite hostile towards the um, uh, or mid and late 2000s toward the Palestinians, like more conservative governments in the West, such as uh, eventually the Stephen Harper government in Canada, it becomes the biggest Canadian donor ever to the Palestinians. So understanding why is all this money going in and life is getting notably worse every every year. So that led me to me to pursue a uh, sort of PhD studying this topic. And and what did you? How did that change? Like for you, you that visit to the Middle East. How did that change your perspective? Well, it definitely has to, in, I would say in, in the West, and, and what's remarkable, and I'll give you my case as an example, I was, I, I grew up in a very small rural town in Canada, and uh, with two television stations and hardly any radio stations that don't play country music. And uh, in spite of that, in spite of that, um, we knew, and I always give this anecdote, uh, when we saw um, on the chalkboard, it's, we Teachers used to write PLO to please leave on when, because back in that era, you would write something with a chalkboard and maybe you don't want that math formula or that French uh, passe composé to be erased by the janitor at the end of the day. We as kids knew at like eight years old that uh, we thought that was a terrorist organization, Palestine Liberation Organization, right? So can you imagine that, like that level of indoctrination about uh, another uh, part of the world uh, in, in this rural area, very young people. Um, so you're always inundated with just just a certain perspective of the of, of the Middle East, uh, particularly in Canada and the United States. And uh, unless you're from a community that really knows the region, and even then, you, you often feel under siege, particularly in Canada, um, just just for knowing that there's a shared humanity across the region. So one of the most important things that Westerners often have to do. And what's valuable for them to go in the Middle East is just go there and also meet people that have it's something I do in my classes. You see the music, the uh, interests, the shared interests, and, and just the extent to which uh, you know, Middle East and Europe are so, actually so intertwined and so similar. I, I actually, it's hard. Like, how can you take away, how can you say the Mediterranean countries are somehow separate? And which is done when you talk about. Europe versus Middle East, but actually there's the Mediterranean, right? So there's so much similar similarities across the region, and, uh, and so it's this is something that people from Middle East go through less. But I know there's always like sort of perceptions about Europe, etc. But they're a lot more exposed to Europe just because of the power power imbalance or the West because of the power imbalance. But in the West, people don't have that experience, and and you know there's so many between cultures. You always pick up very good things. So often in the Middle East, there's that. As we talk about the hospitality, the kindness, the I, I would always I remark about is the the care for children, like the the interest in children. Whereas in the Western media, it's portrayed as if people in the Middle East don't care about children, uh, it, and that's always in, and I think there's a the, there's a sort of a deep love, sort of affection for children that almost Northern Europeans just can't do because we're not culturally inclined to do it. It's not saying that there's any superiority in any system. I'm just saying that. Um, Obviously, it's the sort of racialized interpretation of how the Middle East treats children is, is, is ridiculous. And there's these little nuances that people need to catch on to. So it's very important to us that trip. I think it's really important that element you just described that when you wait, when you go to different countries, um, you realize that we had Peter Oborn on um, a couple of months ago, and he said the same thing. He, he said that he got out the newsroom. He traveled to these countries 
um, Muslim countries in particular. And that's where he, his perspective changed that all the Western narrative, which we've been feeding um, our youth in schools and media and whatnot, it's, it's completely false. And, you know, there's this um, dichotomy of, um, you know, not really understanding the other people. It, it turns between into this us versus them narrative. And it's only when you travel that you kind of see these things um, and you, you get to know one another as well. So I, th I think that's really important. And, and and thank you for giving that perspective as well, because our listeners, a lot of them wouldn't have um, traveled into the Middle East. And like you're saying, it, it does kind of give you a richer and deeper worldview, um, which helps a lot. It, and especially like today's discussion in terms of understanding politics. As I can well. always think of an anecdote, one Palestinian friend like 15 years ago, not a business person, not a, uh, uh, not somebody who's engaged in philosophy, let's put it that way, or, or, or these type of things, uh, just remarked uh, to me the extent to which Hollywood has created damage with its the, the, sort of the idea it's created about Sunni Arab men uh, and, as being inherently violent and terrorist, right? And, and how you, and, and how this has impacted, I mean, it's a broader, been a broader problem in the West and something that, um, it, it's going to take a long time to get away from. I, I give it Canada as an example where I'm situated, just the, the number of, of attacks against Arabs and Muslims and, and the, the mass killings, if you've seen them in London, Ontario the previous year, and the Quebec City mosque shooting. Um, so Canada, which has a very large Arab and Muslim population, uh, that level of violence is really a legacy of that, that, that war and terror and that racism. Hmm. Absolutely. I think let's... Um sort of discuss about some of the kind of donation models around the world there are plenty of examples of conflicts um, where um, different countries have pledged different donations and one example is for example the the UK has given one billion one billion pounds to Yemen since 2015 however we also know that Britain is you know been supplying weapons to Saudi Arabia for the war in Yemen so there's kind of contradictions there and i suppose the question is why are donors and donations failing and you know what's the kind of um re root cause for this at best that money to yemen is guilt money right because the extent to which western countries are arming saudi arabia uh that they feel then some guilt and you see that particularly in countries like canada uk and the united states where even legally it's questionable within their own laws if they should be selling weapons to saudi arabia when they're being used against yemen in this way at the same time, this is where that real politic comes into play. Saudi Arabia is a key ally for them, a more and more important ally. We've seen that with the Biden trip, and they a lot of uh, sort of a lot of the economics of Western countries are tied up in selling weapons to Saudi Arabia and the cheap oil, right? So um, there's some guilt then coming into play to uh, to provide some funding to Yemen, including for local populations in, in, that are pretty hostile to supporting Saudi Arabia and the Emirates in in Yemen. Um, also, certain levels of containment. You can use foreign aid to contain uh, populations in conflict, including ones that you're opposed to, um, and, and preventing a complete humanitarian collapse. Then you then have to deal with such as refugees migrating, such as what happened to Syria. Right? That's for Europe. That's a, I have to say, continent of Europe, and which with, within the West and within NATO, that's really a top priority. So just to wait, um, backtrack on that. Sorry, containment. So they would give this aid. To enable them to stop the refugees coming over so that you know they can kind of deal Correct. with them oh that's interesting that's really that's that's very clear when you look at europe's southern neighborhood policy the palestinians do that's like a very top priority so contain them include that so for the palestinians a lot of funding in the last 10 years has been used to build a palestinian-led security state uh, in large parts of the of, of what's left of the occupied palestinian territory to maintain control over the palestinians uh along with enough sort of funding going in to, to, so that people don't starve and, 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 and that the society doesn't collapse. And you can see that sort of model being applied here and there. There's not even necessarily enough money going in. Uh, there's always that focus on security then. And that's sort of a reflection of the Western sort of id of, 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 of that securitized approach to aid in the Middle East. Um, in the 90s, again, I referred to there being like more of a focus on democracy building, sort of rebuilding societies in the image of the West. But still, there's always been that sort of security and control focus. That's the problem. When governments get involved, they have real politics in mind. 
Um, and the European population, unfortunately, we've seen with, you can see that the difference in the Ukraine war, right? The reaction to the two types of refugees, they just, um, that racialized interpretation in the Middle East um, has a big impact on populations in Europe where, um, for now, I mean, it can change towards Ukrainian refugees. Brexit was kind of one against Polish people, right? That we forget that. Um, for, for now, there's a lot of empathy for Ukrainians amongst Eastern Europeans that clearly didn't, you know, the, the opposite existed for people of, from Afghanistan and Syria and such that were coming into Europe in the mid 2010s. That's brilliant. I think just finally, one thing to ask is, you know, we know that it's obviously a challenging situation, but for those kind of well-meaning donors and charities who want to have, you know, the maximum impact, um, what would you like to see and how could they donate in a particular way to make a difference in these kind of challenging scenarios? Focus on local empowerment, shared knowledge. So always local people will, 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 will know better what it's like when you, you're as you're a doctor, right? What the famous saying is you sort of know your body better than the doctor does, right? This is something I've sort of taken to, to, to heart that in the end you can provide advice and guidance, uh, but you yourself can learn, especially like that sort of north, south, east, west. Um, another society, really, it's very another community. You really don't know how a community operates. So you, you sort of educate each other and then you come to solutions together. Uh, you have to be very humble. Uh, you have to be anti-colonial, anti sort of, but even beyond that, anti um, uh, uh, top down, anti sort of, don't hold power over another person in the situation. I should come up with a better term <laughs> for this, uh, but just be humble in your approach and, and come try to come to shared solutions together. Uh, be honest about your limitations and what funding you are, have. Um, you know, some people, like in the case of the Palestinians, what's going to happen uh, with some populations like Syrians in Northwest Syria, that's sort of like a perpetual aid situation, right? Uh, how do you provide support when there's no clear political outcome? There's no political peace that, that's on the horizon where you can sort of disengage and, and, and but at the same time, aid flows are hard to maintain. So you have to try and be honest about what funding you have. Um, uh, I, at one charity that I've worked with in the UK, that's fantastic, uh, Firefly International, it's a small charity. Um, they invite over the local directors to board meetings of trustees and they, the local directors can see. So for example, the, it was founded in Bosnia and, and so there's a, a little a program in Britschko in Bosnia, a multi-ethnic community in Bosnia. Um, we would invite over the head of the program there to the board meetings, actually see the budget, see what the trustees are doing. Uh, that's pretty extreme for some charities, um, it was, but that's sort of that humble approach, um, respecting their, their incredible capabilities. This is almost the best way you can operate and being wary of what governments are really intending to do. And I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, there's a lot of money that comes out of governments and you can find good individuals within agencies. Every, like sort of as you go up the ring of the ladder, you keep finding good people, but ultimately there's like this power block of, of real politics at the top that you always run into um, that, that gets in your way. Be wary too of just giving money to a conflict situation where your funding can actually exacerbate the conflict. And that comes by picking sides and it's hard not to pick sides. Um, it's, it's hard not, we're sort of inclined often to choose sides in a conflict or to be sympathetic to someone in a situation. Now, I'm not saying when there's a clear aggressor, don't <laughs> start giving them funding, uh, but you have to be very wary in a complex situation. So like Syria is incredibly complex. And so we have a lot of complex feelings like what's going on in Syria, right? Yemen as well, right? So how, how, how do you approach giving, providing aid that you don't you just, you have to watch out, you're not actually reinforcing conflict. Israel, Palestine, by giving money towards the securitization of the Palestinians, you're in no way contributing to a peace process. That's clear now, right? The, the, the American argument was always that once Israel feels comfortable with the, yeah, that it's not gonna be attacked by the Palestinians, then it will want to engage in peace, but we still are not, a, it, it's, it's an endless goalpost that keeps being moved, right? So, and that's clearly the United States choosing its ally in that, in, in that, in that, in that case. So you, if you really want to, improve people's lives you ultimately want to have in complex situations you want to contribute to whatever moves people towards living in peace together so you have to be very aware of giving your funding in that sense and you also have to be very wary in giving your funding that you don't create false expectations that you don't reinforce those old structures of, of power hierarchies often which have been constructed in the last several centuries on a colonial uh, sort of 
architecture. So it's, it's a pretty high level sort of comments I said there. Again, just be humble and, and respect what the local knowledge is. That's, that's that in the end, that, that sort of humility and that shared education is, is ultimately the best approach because all those other things will be clear when you're having that open dialogue together. I think that's really important. And I, I, I'll be honest, I haven't heard a lot of commentators saying that. Um, and that's actually something, you know, I'm a Muslim imam for the Hamdi Muslim community. And that's what Islam teaches. And, you know, we're talking about a lot of Muslim countries here, but it's about that humility, getting to know each other, kind of coming together. And then, you, like you're saying, you, you don't talk down to people, you don't see people as inferior, and you don't go in there saying that we're here to change things and make them like us. And I think that's really crucial, what you've been saying. I, I know there's politics involved, but like you've been stressing um, in today's conversation, you have to be humble and willing to learn um, from the other person and understand their way of living as well. It's not always, you know, um, just the the Western way is the best well, way. You can, you can, I mean, Islamic countries were very, very successful economically for a long time. Many still are, right? So... Uh, just being remade to be like Britain is not going to improve everything. And you can look at the incredible poverty that exists in, in Britain, for example, the homelessness, right? It's something you don't really often see. And um, I, 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 it's a very Anglo, yeah. It's yeah. not highlighted either, right? Yeah, exactly, right? We kind of look at these glitzy successes of, of, of one model and, and what about all of its failures? I'm not saying that, you know, every model has its problems right and that's where that humility comes into play but there's and to this day the universities in the west are still sort of structured on the scene there's this one liberal uh democratic model and it's not speaking against liberalism or democracy but there's an interpretation of it that's probably you can describe as neoliberalism which is very um actually securitized and hierarchical and doesn't allow a, a, sort of any other uh, approaches this has been dominant in west in the western academy and it and really has sort of there's this idea that the rest of the world should be restructured on these sort of neoliberal values uh, in order for the world to live in peace. And we're seeing even questions around that neoliberalism in the West now uh, and, and, these, and, the, and the great wealth inequality, for example, that has, has developed with it. So humility. <laughs> Exactly. I think that that's also, you know, it would be great to have you on again and talk about neoliberalism and what's happening in the academies um, in the Western world, um, especially in North America. But uh, Jer Jeremy, it's been amazing speaking with you. I learned a huge amount and I'm sure our listeners as well will um, really, really take away a lot from this conversation. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Al Hakam Inspire podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Visit our socials on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Al Hakam Inspire. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave your comments there. We would love to hear your feedback and thoughts. So send us an email to inspire at alhakam.org.